he walks right up to me and he sticks out his hand. Now this is pre-COVID, so I did not hesitate in reaching my hand back out, okay? And he shakes my hand and then he begins to go through a litany of shared experiences that we had together. He starts referencing places in the past that I knew of that we had been with each other at. He starts talking about people that I knew that we had shared conversations with. And he starts then talking about dates and times and everything is ringing a bell. And as I looked at him and heard him speak, as I'm thinking in my mind, I'm asking the question, who is this guy? <laughs> he knew everything. But I could not remember who he was. Has that ever happened to you? He was a well-known stranger. I knew this guy for years. Seriously, years. We had shared ministry together in various settings all throughout the city. I had stood alongside him at various events and outreaches. And so when I saw him at another gathering, I started sharing with him all of these shared experiences and common individuals we had, all these times in our recent and not too recent past where we had been alongside each other, the people that we knew. And he looked at me after five minutes and said, and who are you again? <laughs> I was a well-known stranger to this man. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? In our text this morning in Luke chapter 24, we see that this is the experience that happens on the very day when Jesus is resurrected. That later on in that afternoon, we see the story shared of two disciples that are face to face with Jesus. Two disciples that have had a moment with him in the past. And as they are looking into the eyes of Jesus, they have no idea who he is. Their expectations of Jesus, their understanding of Jesus was limited. And as a result, they couldn't see him for who he wanted them to see him as. And we see Jesus in his wonderful, gracious, compassionate way, slowing down and revealing himself at just the right time and in just the right way to these early disciples so that they could have eyes to see Jesus afresh. Eyes to see Jesus not in the way that they wanted, but eyes to see Jesus in the exact way that they needed. They brought to Jesus that afternoon all of their great expectations and disappointments, and they saw Jesus to lovingly redirect them to himself. And so today, what disappointments do you carry to church this morning? What expectations that have yet to have been met in your life do you you carry on your shoulders this morning? What friction in your relationship with your spouse? What lack of breakthrough for your children or your grandchildren? What anxiety do you feel for your work, for your place in your neighborhood? What unanswered prayer have you been seeking God for, for a long, long time? Today, the story of the risen Jesus that we are going to look at through God's word in Luke chapter 24 invites us to bring all of our expectations, all of our struggles, all of our unanswered prayers, all of our uncertainty before the risen Lord and watch how he opens our eyes. And Jesus, though he may appear to us as a well-known stranger, this morning he wants to be our well-known Savior and Lord and friend. Do you want to see him this morning? 
And join me on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. Open your word with me there today. This begins in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together, they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, What is this dispute that you're having with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. This is the word of the Lord. The text tells us that these two disciples, these two followers, that they are making their way towards a town called Emmaus, seven miles out from Jerusalem. Now, while you would think it would be easy to actually locate that location based upon the specificity here in the text, scholars debate the exact place that they are referencing. Several different towns are an option, but no matter that small detail, the truth of this story is here, that these disciples, these followers of Jesus, these two individuals that know Jesus, have spent time with Jesus, know some of Jesus' followers that they are leaving the scene of the crime, if you will, full of discouragement, full of sadness. The events that have just happened these several days leave them with this weighty anxiety, these questions in their mind. And so into this scene, we see Jesus show up. Jesus shows up and sees these two individuals walking on the road. And by the way, uh, we know one of the names of the individuals, Cleopas. It says it here coming up. Uh, It's often believed that most likely the one walking with Cleopas is his wife. And so for millennia, Christians have looked at this couple as a model for many marriages of a husband and a wife coming together with the greatest questions and needs and anxieties of their hearts and looking to Jesus. But whether or not you're married here this morning, we see this inclination and the desire of these disciples to be ones that we ought to have as well. Where was and who was Jesus? Jesus looks at them and he says, what is this dispute that you are having? Could you imagine potentially A husband and wife arguing? I can't. Not not for me. Most likely this husband and wife are having a little bit of a... uh, uh. Jesus asks them and, and, and then they stop and when he looks at them, the text says there was discouragement on their face. Think of it. They are looking for answers about Jesus. Jesus is right in front of their eyes, and to them in that moment, he's a stranger. When we look at life without resurrection, it leads to disappointment. When we look even at Jesus without the understanding of his resurrection, that He is alive, that he has conquered death and the grave. When we look at life and Jesus without the lens of Easter morning, we will find ourselves disappointed, very much like Cleopas and his wife did that very afternoon. You know, think of it this way, uh, uh, that in various phases of our life, we may struggle with various outlooks on our life. We may look at the world uh, not through the hope of resurrection. We may not look at Jesus through the lens that he is alive and that we have hope as a result, but, but we may look at life through the various circumstances that are weighing down on us in that moment. Uh, as a way of illustration, think of it like this. As a young child, there are moments when a little child looks at life through the lens of naivete. And through their naive outlook, 
They may seem joyful in the moment, but as an adult or a parent, you know that the world is going to get hard. Are you with me? Uh, There's something joyful about seeing a young child naively look and be excited about what's in front of them, not realizing that this world is often full of danger. Have you ever seen that? Perhaps with a kid as you're playing with them. And I remember scenes like this in my own life with my own kids growing up when they were little. Uh, where they were running and playing and having fun in the yard, and then all of a sudden they're galloping with joy on their face right into the middle of the street. And what do you do? No! (laughs) I remember my son, when we were young, he, he used to jump on the bed, and I used to throw him on the other side and grab him head first before it hit the ground on the other side, you know? My wife wasn't home when I would do that exercise. And I remember he would just naively and in great trust go with a headlong dive and I would grab him in the back, you know. And then one time he tried to do it when I wasn't there and, you know, he's on the ground crying, right? Right? Naivete, uh, there's something intriguing and cute about it, but that's no way to live life, is it? That maturity means that you recognize this world often without resurrection is hard. Or or think this morning of the middle-aged person, that middle-aged person who has perhaps been through a lot, and they no longer look at life through the naive lens of hopeful optimism and the joy of getting an ice cream sandwich, but they look at life through the lens of cynicism. They're cynical about every situation and every person. As a side note, if you're in that season, Go read the book of Ecclesiastes, okay? And I know talking to a bunch of New Yorkers that none of us struggle with cynicism. (laughs) You know, I I, I struggle here. We were talking about someone and they were so positive and and, and so joyful to be around and and so encouraging. And and I was talking about them with my wife and I said to them, yeah, there's got to be something up. They got an angle. Are you with me? I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't buy, you know, tomatoes at the grocery store without thinking, what are they, what are they trying to pull over me, you know? And, and many of us live our Christian life with this edge of cynicism, where this childlike faith and wonder in Jesus is gone, and we are always on edge trying to figure out None of you struggle with this. Good. No, I don't either. (laughs) And then there's those of us this morning that could perhaps be characteristic of those that have lived long. And at the end of their life, as they look back on regrets and shame and guilt, it's not naivete, it's, it's not cynicism, but it's despondency. And they look at the world and they process the challenges before them with this feeling of loss and missed opportunities and the reality that life is short. And apart from resurrection, at various seasons and moments in our life, we could hop between those. I hope you caught the metaphor this morning. You, you may be the oldest person in the room and struggle with a naivete that doesn't ground you in the reality of this world. You could be the youngest person in the room and struggle with the despondency because you have seen and gone through much more than someone your age should have had to by that time. And no matter what you are holding in you and on you, outside of resurrection, disappointment and pain and loss could be overbearing. And for this couple, this couple, as they are looking to Jesus, not thinking through the lens of resurrection and what he has done in their life, they have given in to cynicism and They have given into despondency in their life and in their heart. Who are you this morning? Naive? Cynical? Despondent? It's into this that that Jesus begins to go deeper. 
It says in verse 18 and following, the one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asks them. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who who was a prophet powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Do you hear their expectations? Besides all this, it's, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. This story has been said to be one of the most beautifully written and artistic of all of Luke's writings. And Luke, remember, has written a lot of the New Testament, Luke and Acts. This story is just filled in this moment in the scene with this great irony. Do you see it? Jesus is there and he, he asks them, uh, what, what, what's going on? You know, what things have happened? Uh, you think Jesus knew the things that had happened? <laughs> they had happened primarily because of and to, to him. And so they, they began to, to, to share their remembrances of what has just happened in these last few days. Jesus, we put our hope in him. We were hoping that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. You see it in verse 21? We were the ones that were hoping that he was the one that was going to come through. They had expectations of Jesus, but they couldn't see the heightened expectations that he would have for them. Why couldn't they notice him? Well, some have commented on that Jesus, uh, after his post-resurrection, we see in various settings where he is not seen, that there's something perhaps changed about him in this resurrection body, that at least there is a moment of of gap between recognition, and that's definitely true. But I think as well we, we notice in the text that as they are confronted with the risen Jesus in this moment, there is no way they thought that was way that they were going to see Jesus again. They just didn't believe it. Jesus did not meet their expectations. They wanted Jesus to redeem their circumstances. And Jesus was coming to redeem their souls and to redeem the whole world. They brought to Jesus these expectations of political prowess and military advantage and hope like various Jewish leaders in the past had done in rising up to conquer the then known occupying outside nations of that day. Remember what we talked about on Palm Sunday. These are the expectations they bring as they say, Hosanna, save us, save now. Like Judas Maccabeus the hammer did hundreds of years prior. Jesus, save now. And in this moment they're saying, Jesus, we were looking to you for power and peace in Jerusalem today. But Jesus came for much more. what, What are you looking to Jesus for today? Are you looking to Jesus? Am I looking to Jesus just to redeem the circumstances in my life that I'm going through? All of us have them. Those challenges. Challenges in our marriages. Challenges in raising our kids. 
challenges in the workplace, challenges with our careers, challenges for the future, challenges in our neighborhood, financial burdens, physical ailments, all of these things. Are we looking to Jesus as to be our personal uh, uh, concierge to meet the various demands of the circumstances that I have in my life? If we do, if we're looking to Jesus like this without understanding what he truly has come for, we will live a confused and disappointed life. Or are we looking to Jesus perhaps this morning to, to, to validate my cause? You know, my opinion is obviously right. I need Jesus now to rubber stamp it. You've never fallen into this, right? You know, uh, here, here's a little insight. I heard a preacher say this, and I think about it all the time. If when you study the Word of God and you meditate on Jesus and He is always agreeing with you, you are not worshiping Jesus. You are worshiping an idealized version of yourself. If Jesus becomes the rubber stamp to say, ah, yes, <laughs> see, then we're coming to Jesus without understanding. It'll lead to confusion and disappointment. Or perhaps some of us here this morning are coming to Jesus because we like to check boxes. And we have compartmentalized our life in such a way that it feels good for us to check off that box of spirituality and religion. We check off the box of health, check. We check off the box of career, check. We check off the box of family, check. We check off the box of, 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 of entertainment, check. And then we come to our spirituality and say, ah, you know, you got to have a little Jesus in the mix and you... You listen to a sermon or you come to church or you, you read the scriptures every day just for the purpose of saying, did that, done that. Maybe I'll get back to it tomorrow or next week or next Easter, you know. And Jesus wants us to see him as much more than just a check in the box to one small aspect of our life. Jesus demands so much more. He is worthy of so much more. For these disciples here, he came to do more than just to redeem their circumstances in that day in Jerusalem and Israel. He, he came to redeem their souls and to redeem the whole world. Even as these disciples are talking about the experiences of that morning, they have already heard the reports of Mary Magdalene. Remember, we talked about her last week, how she came to the tomb with her grief and her pain and her loss, and Jesus met her, and they're like, yeah, the people said they saw him. Did you hear it? Some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early, and they didn't find his body. They came and reported it, and others went as well. Others who went to the tomb found it just as they had said, but they didn't see him. Do you see the irony here? These two individuals are commenting on these disciples not seeing Jesus at the tomb when they are not seeing Jesus right before their very eyes. See, it's a reminder to us it's not just about physical proximity to Jesus that means we have true understanding and lasting and transformative faith. It's a matter of our heart. Do we see Jesus how he wants to be seen? As the redeemer of our souls, as the restorer of all things. And so the plot continues to thicken. We see in verse 25 of Luke 24 the following. He said to them, how foolish and slow you are to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And they came near the village where they were going and he gave the impression he was going farther 
But they urged him, stay with us because it is almost evening. And now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered who said the Lord has been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he made known was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Jesus makes himself known. And these disciples, they get to see him. It says in the text that Jesus begins by saying to them, don't you know and see how all of the story of Scripture was pointing to Jesus? This would not have been a new way of interpretation in the first century. In fact, there are many other Jewish leaders and scholars and exegetes of the word who were looking for the deeper, truer meaning of Scripture as it found its fulfillment. Uh, There were actually hermeneutical schools all built up around this, uh, ways of interpreting. And one's called Midrash, the other a Pesher, ways of looking at Scripture and trying to glean from it with commentary, the truth beneath the surface And Jesus comes into this tradition and says the ultimate authority and the ultimate translation and the ultimate fulfillment is me. I mean, would you have loved to have sat in on that Bible study? I I, I, I mean, imagine Jesus tracing out with this couple his plan and purpose from the beginning in the very word of God. Trace it with me in your own mind even now in the, in the very beginning God created it all in perfect union with him. But humanity chose to go astray, didn't they? And that there was the promise from the very opening pages of scripture that there would come a seed from the woman who would crush the head of the Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, the the first gospel, that right from the very opening pages of Scripture, there's been hinting and hoping of one to come. We fast forward and we think of then God calling out Abraham and saying that through you, through your family, all the world will be blessed. Through you I will make a nation that will bless all people. And this Abrahamic covenant is established that through Israel, God would show himself mighty and present. You could track the other stories, can't you? You think of David and King David and the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7 where where God says through the line of Judah and through David, there will always be one to sit on the throne through whom all people will one day give allegiance and hope and praise. It's, It's been going on from the very beginning of Scripture, Jesus is saying. Even in the prophets themselves, Jeremiah says that there is a new covenant. I'm going to write it on your heart. I'm going to change you from the inside out. And that is just a cursor look at just the main themes. We think of the bronze serpent lifted up as the hope that one who will someday be lifted up will be healing to all people. We think of the true manna in the wilderness that sustains us when we are parched and hungry and dry. We think of the whole sacrificial system as a reminder to us that there must be blood for there to be forgiveness and remission of sins and how they are always imperfect ultimately pointing to the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, Jesus and who he was and, and who he was no doubt explaining him to be themselves to be is iterate, reiterating to them that the whole story has been about me. Not in some proof texting way. I'm not saying open up your Bible, flip it, go like this and say, ah, 
Jesus must be in this verse somewhere. I'm not saying look for every little fine-tuned little situation and try to read something into it. What I'm saying is that the whole of Scripture has been leading up to this story from creation, fall, to redemption and restoration of all things. It's all about Jesus. And Jesus' plan and expectations for them is greater than just having a Jewish military leader in charge in Jerusalem in that day. He desires to redeem their souls and to restore the world. Amen? And if you know Jesus today, if you see Jesus through this lens today, that means whatever our expectations, whatever our disappointments, to know Jesus means we know the one who redeems our souls and restores the world. The one through whom and to whom all things will return. Seeing Jesus in the word and at the table, it should captivate our minds and inflame our hearts. Notice that as he's sharing the word with them later on, they comment our hearts were starting to be aflamed with us. But when he sits down with what I believe this husband and wife and breaks bread, that's when they what? That's when the stranger becomes well known to them, doesn't it? And listen, details like this are not ones to be passed over. It's a reminder that in word and in sacrament, in word and in the table, in word and in communion, it's a reminder to us that God is real. Jesus is real. His presence is there. His power is there. That Jesus shows up. And so as he breaks the bread, it's a reminder to them, no doubt, of what happened just a few days prior at the communion. That as a sign and a symbol of his life and his death, that Jesus shows that he is with us in that moment. That there's a special way that he manifests himself to us like this. And for us today, when we worship God and look to his word, and when we share in communion together at the table, we are saying, Lord, I want to see things and understand the world and understand my situations and my burdens and my pains through the lens of what has been told about you and what you have done. And when we do that, we're not disappointed. When we do that, we don't have to be confused. When we see Jesus in light of all that he has done and is doing, our heads and our hearts can be captivated and inflamed because to know him means life, means forgiveness. And as we remember his death, as we celebrate his life, it changes us. And I love how the story unfolds. As he does that, they, they see it. Their, their eyes are open. They're, they're captivated by Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Gone. Gone. I mean, that would have been frustrating to me, you know. <laughs> In that moment, if I was Cleopas, I would have said, hey, whoa, 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 I got some more questions now. Can you repeat that part about what happened there in Leviticus one more time? Because I'm still not totally right. But it wasn't meant for them and it's not meant for us to cling on to Jesus and have him meet our very demands. It's not that Jesus is there for redeem our circumstances alone. It's so that we might look to him, the resurrected Lord, by faith, knowing that because the resurrection happened, everything works out in the end. And our life today has purpose. Our lives gain perspective because of resurrection. So think with me once again, those three groups or phases of life, the naive. Our life gains perspective with the resurrection because uh, living a life of naive optimism will often, no doubt, run into a brick wall at some point, won't it? Like my child running with his arms behind his back. The fall off the bed could hurt. And the resurrection tells us that yes, this world will be full of pain. 
But because Jesus is alive, we don't have to worry that this world is it. That he's going to remake it. And that there's a new heaven to come. And so when we run into that proverbial brick wall in our life, the resurrection tells us God showed up on the other side and came back and said there is hope. For those of us this morning in that season of cynicism, I know you New Yorkers, don't give me that. Where yeah, 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 there's always an angle. Yeah, yeah, I know Jesus could show up and do things, but people are going to disappoint me. Yes, I, I know Jesus is powerful, but ah, you know, more pains up ahead. Jesus, when we see him through the lens of resurrection, invites us to, yes, be grounded in the reality that this world is hard. Jesus experienced it, did he not? Quick reminder, there's no need for resurrection if you are not dead first. Jesus was dead, and he is now. And so for the cynical heart, we do not need to look to this world alone as it is to answer all our deepest pains. We look to Jesus, the resurrected one, who has said, into the pain of this world, I bring life. And today, as resurrection people, we could proclaim and live out this resurrection life with the reality that is grounded in the pain of this world, but in the hope that it is not the end. Because the resurrection happened, all things work out. Amen? And because of the despondent today, for those of you perhaps going through a season of processing great pain and loss, and it does not matter how old you are to be going through a season like this, where it may seem like all hope is lost, where you wish you had the mental capacity and wherewithal right now to even have a cynical spirit, you're just, you're just giving up. The resurrection tells us because Jesus is alive, the victory has been won. And that though in this world loss is real and perhaps even long-lasting, that ultimately, because Jesus redeems our soul and restores the world, we can look to him for hope today. Are you with me? For the brokenhearted and despondent today, the risen Jesus tells us, don't look at me like a stranger. Look at me as one who has gone through pain and loss and despondency and separation and grief and agony and despair and I have taken it on myself and there is hope on the other side because Jesus is, he is risen, he is risen. I thought you forgot, it was only a week ago. Our stories have purpose today. Because of the story. I want to encourage us when we approach God's word that, that we don't just uh, come to the word uh, with this desire to gain head knowledge. We come to the word, though, with the desire to gain a knowledge that will change and transform our hearts. That we will see the story of Jesus being worked out and we will submit ourselves to it more and more. Some of us need to get into the story more. Not just as a check off the list item I do, but as an attitude of, Lord, I want to know you and your story, and I want to follow after Jesus. Some of us, as couples, as it says here, if most likely if this is a couple, what a model for couples to seek God's will in their life. Lord, may I seek you in your word. May I find you present in my life in this way. Lord, may I with excited application in head and heart seek to follow you. Pray for God's presence and guidance when you get into his word. And when we break the table together, this outward sign of this inward reality of salvation that comes through Jesus, when we enjoy the table together with each other, we proclaim that Jesus is alive, that he's coming again. And we need each other to encourage each other on this path. Amen? 
Because our stories find purpose because of the story. And Jesus is the main character. And he is worthy to follow. So, today, do you see that well-known stranger? Do you know this well-known stranger? Have your eyes been opened to see Jesus like this? To see him not just as a cosmic gumball machine to give you what you want, to not see him just as an asset to agree with you on the things that you're already going to do no matter what, to not look at him to redeem your only personal circumstances, but as Jesus who redeems your soul and who will restore the world. When we look at Jesus like this, we can have the joy like Cleopas and his wife had as they worshipped Jesus and could not help but tell others that Jesus has come for them. Do you see him like this this morning? Do you see the well-known stranger? Will you trust him? Will you give up naivete? Will you give up cynicism? Will I give up despondency? And find him present and ever faithful. Amen.